Hello, welcome to Extraordinary Women TV with Shannon Skinner. I'm your host. Well, my guest today is Martha Deacon, who is the founder and CEO of the Townships Project. Um, she'll be talking about microfinancing and microfranchising in South Africa. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to this one. Later in the segment, before we take a break, I'll have my regular Good to Know Minute when I ask my guests for their top success tip, and you're going to hear Martha's. Martha Deacon, it's great to have you here today. Delighted to be here. Now, you are the Chief Executive Officer of the Townships Projects, with his, which is really a Canadian nonprofit organization jump starting business in South African townships through micro lending, micro franchising, and asset based community development. Wow. <laughs> it sounds big. Well, it really uh, intrigues me uh, what you're doing, and, uh, and I welcome you formally to the show today. Thank you, Shannon. So your background, I mean, this is what you're doing now, but of course um, your, your background is very interesting. You began your career in law. Well, and even before that, I actually taught school. That's right, you taught school. I taught school. I taught French and music at Athena Elementary School in Summerside, taking over Anne Murray's job. Right. Mm -hmm. And after that, I went to Dalhousie Law School and ended up as a, uh, as a corporate commercial and securities lawyer on Bay Street. And uh, from then, I went from the frying pan into the fire and became an investment banker. And, wow. And uh, I started a firm with, a, with a, a colleagues. Uh, that was eventually bought out by Barclays Bank, a subsidiary right. of Barclays Bank. Congratulations. Uh, it was a, a very interesting background uh, in finance and in law, and it didn't, I would never have predicted where I'd end up uh, in a million years. But I did find myself, uh, having sold a business in 1998, I went walkabout, as the Australians say. Right. And I ended up on my way to Zimbabwe to a conference. I stopped in South Africa in the townships and uh, it changed my life. Now let's go back to Anne Murray. <laughs> you took over Anne Murray's job? I've She's never met teacher? her. I've never met her, oh, but okay. I, I, I thought it was, uh, it was a great thing to do. I, I, again, it was a bit impulsive. I, I was uh, out on a camping trip in Prince Edward Island, and there was an advertisement in the newspaper for a teaching job, and I found out that um, they needed someone to teach uh, French, no, it was music and gym, because that's what she taught, music and gym. I didn't have the gym part, but I had the French part, so I ended up teaching music and French. And it was not, I was not a good teacher. I thought law school was a much better alternative. <laughs> but you didn't meet Anne-Marie. I never met her. Well, it would be fascinating if you did now, wouldn't it? Now, you're, you're uh, today, I mean, you have founded, uh, it was in 1998, you founded the Townships Project. Um, Let's talk about it. I mean, how did it actually get its start? What, what really well, sparked it? Well, as I say, I was on my way to a conference in Zimbabwe, and I thought I'd go through South Africa. I'd never been to South Africa. This is four years into democracy, and we had always, all of us had heard about the townships, and, and we'd seen the, the, the newspaper uh, and the, and the uh, television coverage of the townships, and it seemed like a violent place, but an exciting place to be, so I made it my business to visit three townships. I went to Kailicha outside Cape Town, Kwamashu outside Durban, and to Soweto. And the day I was in Soweto, um, I got out of the bus thinking, all oh, right, okay, there's some pictures here, I need to see them. And what I saw were the pictures of Hector Peterson on June 16th, 1976, who was killed. He was shot to death right. by the apartheid forces. And it absolutely stopped me dead in my tracks. And I thought, I can't live in a world like this. I, I have to do something about this. Uh, why, are there, why is there no commerce here? Why is it just single, single family dwellings and, and there's no business going on? I'm a business person. Surely I can do something about this. At least I can try. Maybe I can, maybe I can't, but at least I'll, I can try. I'll give it a year. So that was how it started. I said I'd give it a year, and I obviously can't count very well because <laughs> it's now 13 years, and I cannot stop. Now, let's talk a little bit about you know, what is the Townships Project? I mean, what is it that, that you do? Uh, it is a Canadian registered charity, mm -hmm. uh, which is alleviating poverty by making very small loans to the very poorest, mostly women, to start or expand a small business. And uh, the world has become quite familiar with the concept of microfinance uh, and microlending, which is a, a portion of microfinance. In the last uh, few years, particularly since Mohammed Yunus won the Nobel Peace Prize for just that work with the Grameen Bank in 2006. Right, yes. 
So I had well met known. Muhammad Yunus, oh, actually, wow. in the 80s. He I did meet. Anne Murray I didn't, but Muhammad Yunus I did, uh, in, right here in Toronto. How inspiring. It was fantastic yeah. to meet him. Mm -hmm. At a time when, when uh, people didn't, weren't aware of what he was doing, he was really just starting out, still struggling in, in Bangladesh. Uh, but what he did, what he brought to the world, was uh, a, the proof that the poor are credit worthy and that they always pay back their loans. And that was what I started with in, in, when I started to work in the townships, understanding that uh, if, if you could find a way to make loans to the very poorest, they would pay those loans back and they would, from the day one, be able to feed their families and send their children to school and get out of the despair that they had to face otherwise every morning. Wow. Now, um, you know, let's maybe talk about the concept of micro lending. Uh, you know, for those who are watching who maybe have a sense or maybe they don't really know what it's about. I mean, how does it work? It is so simple. It's, it's, it's like the best things in the world, like the wheel. Um, micro lending, in its essence, is the making of very small loans, typically starting at $100 to the very poorest, people living on $2 or less a day. Oh, yeah. The loans are made uh, because people uh, who are very poor do not have security. You know, when we go to buy, to get a loan to buy a car, we put the car up as security. These people have no security. So instead of that security of thing, they give a security of character. So they, the loans are made to groups of women, usually in groups of five. Uh, and so everybody becomes the surety, becomes the guarantee for the repayment of that loan by the others. And another really interesting portion of this is because um, you don't have anything more than that, so you need to give a, a not just a, um, a, a stick, which is that if you don't pay back your loan, nobody in your, in your group gets another loan, but you have a carrot. If you pay back your loan, you have right, as of right, get a larger loan. So people can pull themselves up the ladder uh, to out of poverty and into prosperity. So it's really, it's a remarkable uh, discovery. And to date, I know it's, hel it's helped more than 200 million individuals worldwide. And each one of those individual borrowers affects on average five other individuals. So this is certainly one of the keys to alleviating poverty, is that? I, I, think, it's, I think it's critical. Yeah. Uh, it's something that you can't do without, but it absolutely by itself is not sufficient. Right, there's a lot of factors, of course. And that's where I think what we do and what we're leading into now is unique in that for after 13 years of doing this, by the way, through microfinance institutions on the ground, we don't, take, we don't send anybody in. I've had a wonderful opportunity over these past 13 years to meet and discover really incredible South Africans. Uh, who, one in particular who we work closely with, uh, Yvonne Redinku, uh, grew up in Soweto, and she started the microfinance institution she runs. She started it out of her own funds, out of her own pocket. This is an extraordinary thing to do. And she, she's doing an incredible job at this point, and we are supporting that. Now, uh, and what makes your organization unique is it goes beyond the microlending. Um. Yeah, I mean, I guess there are two things that mm. I would say um, make the Townships Project unique. The first one is that we're terrifically grassroots. We're grassroots here in that we're supported by really um, hundreds and hundreds of individual Canadians. I did not start with government funding. We've never had government funding of any kind. Um, and we, we have, apart from one family foundation, which is fantastic, we've had their support. It's been individual Canadians across the country, from, from Halifax, from Newfoundland, right to Vancouver, and through th that, that have supported us. So that's, that's in interesting. It's grassroots here, but it's also grassroots in South Africa. And so over all that period of time, we have learned that there are limitations to microfinance, micro lending, uh, and that, that um, there are ways uh, in, in, within every society to fill, to, to, to get past those limitations. And one of the ways that we have in the last year uh, been working with, which is really exciting, is the concept of micro-franchising. Micro-franchising, okay. And, yeah, yeah. and that is simply bringing the most successful business system ever created on earth, franchising, franchising got to it. bear on the most intractable problem that we face today, which is poverty. And when you look at the, the key elements of franchising, which are branding, replication, and systematization. There's nothing in there that says that you have to have a million dollars to start a franchise. 
So what we have come to realize with, again, with the feedback that we're constantly getting, we get reports every month and they are on our website, with the feedback that we're getting, we, we understand that there are the same sorts of businesses in every township and that if there could be the systematization and the kind of branding that we have for larger businesses, there could be the bulk buying, the kinds of getting better things and better services for cheaper that exists in franchising generally could be brought down to the, to the, to the level of the townships and a smaller cost, uh, franchises that cost let's say even two or three hundred dollars. This is an incredible change and an incredible opportunity uh, for creating a, a job creation engine at the bottom of the economic pyramid and that's what we're pushing to now. Now can you uh, give us an example then of um, you know, uh, a, you know a, a case study or an example of uh, someone you've helped uh, in a situation or an example of what it could look like? I can give you lots of examples and I'll fix on two. Um, there was a chap called Cabello Cali from um, Soweto. He runs a company called Keys Communications and uh, Cabello is, a, is an am amazing guy. He understood that uh, outside in, in, the, in the very formal world there are hoardings, there are billboards of advertising business throughout, throughout Johannesburg but there weren't any in the townships but if you put a, a billboard up in the township it would get ripped down so Cabello's answer, he paints walls and he, he hires um, the uh, local artists in the community, often young men and young women with really no other opportunity for artistic outlet, and they paint them. And he, he rents these walls from the grannies who own the homes. And this is becoming, he's able to do this on a countrywide basis, and Cabello is now looking into franchising his business, which is fantastic, out of the townships and across the country. And another one, uh, which I think is very exciting, is a young woman called Eileen de Jaeger, who started a cleaning company. It's called Crime Scene Cleanup. We all know that there's a, a high right. rate of crime in South Africa. Um, but it's not just crime scenes. It, it can be any industrial waste as well. And Eileen is now taking her business, which she started in the suburbs, in the, in the formal suburbs, into the township areas and, and helping uh, the, the municipalities and the school children become aware that there are, uh, there are ways of, destroy, of um, dealing with, with waste that are much more sanitary and much more... Um, uh, much more supportive of public health than they are and and this is really another opportunity for Eileen to take a, a very successful business that she started outside the townships and bring it into the townships. Well fascinating stuff. Now we're going to take a quick break Martha and this means it's my good to know minute and I know you've got a great success tip so <laughs> jump right in there. Well Shannon, um, I guess I, what I'd like to say is that it is scientifically true that each one of us is unique there's never going to be another Shannon and there's never going to be another me and that I think it follows from that that each one of us has something very specific that we're intended to do and I think my um, uh, passion is really to find out what it is that each one of us is meant to do there, there, could, there are lots and lots of corporate commercial securities lawyers, there's lots and lots of investment bankers, but I'm pretty sure that, that from my standpoint, I'm the only one who, look, who looks upon what I'm doing as, as something that's really um, next to heaven for me. For many people, it would be their idea of hell. So my, my, my um, uh, suggestion would be to find what you and only you can do and to hold on to it for dear life and never give it up. Well, thanks for that. So find your uniqueness. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, more with Martha Deacon, uh, who is the founder and CEO of the Townships Project. We'll be talking more about her work in South Africa. So stay right there. Welcome back to the show. I'm Shannon Skinner, and uh, my guest is Martha Deacon, who is the founder and CEO of the Townships Project. We're talking about microfinancing and microfranchising in South Africa. Certainly, one way to alleviate poverty. Um, what a, a, a great idea! Where do you uh, get your support to keep going? I mean, this, there must be great challenges, and and you must have to find some support from well, some means. <laughs> there, there certainly are great challenges every day. I must say, it's the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life, but. It, the Even more difficult than investment banking? There's, there's no question. It's, 
20 times more difficult than either corporate commercial securities law or investment banking. There is no question about that. Right. Um, if, if these were easy problems to, be, to deal with, they would, they would have been dealt with. And the inspiration, very simply, comes from, from the women that we're helping and that are, are um, opening up their lives to us and in South Africa. I, I just cannot even imagine. It's so humbling to meet these people who, if you, well, I don't know about you, but I can tell you about me. If I had to live in those circumstances, I think I'd just curl up and die. I, am, I just am absolutely struck so constantly by the courage it takes, by, the, by their incredible generosity their, to their families and to their children and to their communities that they keep going. And uh, I also think to myself, my gosh, you know, this world needs these people. They're only poor. They're not stupid. They have so much to offer us. And, and if you think about it, you know, 200 years ago, we were all in this, virtually 90% of us were in this situation of abject poverty. So, yeah, we can make a difference. Uh, every single dollar that is given over here makes an incredible difference over there. We're, I like to say that every $50 can change a life. But in fact, you know what? It's sad to say it doesn't even cost $50 to give these people an opportunity. It's less than that. So I want to get that message across. Yes, we can make a difference. Now, you know, a lot of these people, um, their struggles, I mean, they face, it takes courage to just, in some cases, just to leave the village to go get water. You know, in some cases, their um, security. There's, there's certainly, uh, certainly in South Africa, there's a huge problem of security. Um, but, but it's also a different, a different situation than a lot of the countries in Africa. And I mean, there's, there's a good reason why I am in South Africa at this, at this juncture. Um, when I started work there, I didn't really understand so much how, what a fantastic choice it was. But South Africa uh, is, is the, the most wealthiest country, um, at least on a per capita basis, if not the, 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 uh, fully 40% of South Africans are living on $2 a day or less. So from that standpoint, there's a huge body of people who live in abject poverty. But on the plus side, there is, the, there is fantastic infrastructure in that country. And if we can start a, revol a, a financial revolution and a, and, a, and a prosperity revolution there, it will go up the whole continent. Because the continent of Africa is the, is the poorest in terms of per capita income and the richest by far in terms of natural resources. So there's an opportunity there for this world to to make a huge turnaround in terms of absolute poverty. Is uh, Africa getting poorer? I think that the, the answer to that was yes. It would have been yes until quite recently. I mean, the, the, there's very little you can do anywhere until the shooting wars stop, and the shooting wars are, are, right. are, are slowing down. And at that point, then, I think people who are into uh, social entrepreneurship and who are, who are, are, who are really trying to, uh, to deal with these problems at the bottom of the economic pyramid at that point there is tremendous opportunities. And I think that certainly in a place like South Africa where uh, franchising is, is extremely well rooted, there are tremendous skills and there's a, there's a fantastic uh, um, uh, stock exchange. There are all the things that one needs, all the raw materials are there, but that leadership needs to be there to start to bring some of these uh, opportunities to bear at the bottom of the pyramid. And I think micro finance is one thing through micro loans and, and uh, insurance being offered to the poorest and all kinds of things like that. And micro franchising, systematizing these businesses and, and making sure that there are thousands and thousands of outlets that are profitable and that are resaleable for the poorest. They begin to build assets and you're into prosperity creation at that point and not just poverty alleviation. You know, one of the things that uh, you support are, are the communities looking at uh, uh, what are their assets and how can they use their assets um, to help get them what they need. Uh, can you give us an example of what those assets are? I mean, we're not necessarily talking real estate. Uh, this is, this is uh, something that, that I find so interesting, that you can go into a community with the, with the old kind of aid question, uh, and what do you need? And you'll get a, a whole lot of answers, and they, and they will be victim answers. And, and, and yet, if you go in and, you, and, and people in the community are asked a question, what do we have? And they start to, to, to think. They, they interview each other, and they, they list the skills that they have. And they, they look at the, the businesses that are in the uh, community, and they look at uh, the people who do have jobs and the, and the, the uh, perhaps remittances that are coming from family abroad they end up inevitably saying, my gosh, we in fact are quite rich. 
and then you, you do that's the balance sheet and then you do the, the income statement and you say well who's earning what and, and what money are we spending what's coming in and where are we spending it and in the poorest communities they usually find they're spending it all outside their community it's not circling in their community and, and, co and creating greater wealth so they again say my gosh we're quite rich if we could now only use what we have and use it to get what we really want. And it just completely changes the mindset. And if at that point they are aware that they can get loans to start doing what they want to do, that gives them a push. Now, their assets could be then skills, perhaps knowledge, maybe even connections. Ah, absolutely. Who do you know? Whose brother is there and whose sister works here and that sort of thing. And they can even be uh, very much, a bit coming from a legal background, they can be their, their human rights, their legal rights that they just have not thought about before and have never sort of thought as a community of, of uh, asserting their rights, their rights to government services, their rights to, uh, to be treated differently. And this also can be very empowering for a community. You know, in, in the research that I was doing, <coughs> there are, um, you know, there are, are uh, some options or very limited options available to people there, but uh, certainly, you know, um, uh, there have been situations where if people really want uh, money to, to develop their businesses, they, they, one option, depending where they are, are really only the loan sharks, and then the loan sharks charge them 600% interest for a year. Um, so, you know, thankfully there are organizations like yours. Um I, I think it's, there, there are a couple of things that are very important. It's true that we offer in our, our uh, microfinance institutions who offer these loans give an alternative to the loan sharks uh, who can charge even as much as 50% a week, which is unbelievable. But also, very importantly, we're only um, giving loans to people who are starting or expanding a small business. Because if you give a consumer loan to a very poor person, you are making an, a bad situation much worse because there's no way for them to repay it. So it's very important that, that these loans are given to start or expand a small business. Martha, I have to ask you this question. Who is your greatest source of inspiration? Well, I couldn't say it's one, only one person, but given the line of work I'm now in, mm. I have to say there are two I must mention up front, and one would be Nelson Mandela, for sure. Uh, for, for showing the world uh, that uh, there is a way out of the most oppressive situations and a way that it's, it's, it's with such grace he, he understood that you, you cannot return poison with poison. And it, it, he's just been such an inspiration to the world. And the, another one, of course, would be Muhammad Yunus, who right. I've already mentioned, who proved that the poor always pay back their loans. But overall, it has to be the women who borrow the money to start a business to support their families and to make sure that their children are going to be able to really contribute to this world in ways they didn't have an opportunity to do. Now, when you are not busy with your organization, um, you have some hobbies. Oh, I do. I don't know where you I find the time, do. but yeah, I know that you have some hobbies. I, I, um, I hike. I, I was very fortunate this, this uh, spring to do uh, a few hundred kilometers on the Camino in Spain, which was fantastic. Wow. How, uh, how inspiring just is that? I loved yeah. it. Uh, one, it's one of the very few places, I think, in the world that a woman can walk alone and be safe, which is fantastic. I, I read a lot, uh, and, and I, I sing, actually. I've always sung in a choir. I, I call it my team sport. I really like to sing in a choir. Love it. Choral singing. Choral team singing. sport. Yep. Now, in all this that you've done I mean, in your career as uh, from, from corporate law to well, teaching to corporate law to investment banking to being an entrepreneur and, uh, and, and making a difference with uh, people in South Africa, you've seen and experienced a lot. How would you define success? Well, certainly um, what I've tried to do, what I continually try to do every day is remember that each one of us is unique. Each one of us has a job to do that follows from that, and we must always strive to, to become the most me, the most ourselves that we possibly can, and to never, once we've found that, never lose sight of it, never give up, because it's a rough road. Everybody's fighting a hard battle in this world, every one of us, and we must be aware of that and, and try to help every person become the, the person they're meant to be.
Now, Martha, if anyone wants to get involved um, or to contact you or simply uh, find out more information, how do they reach you? Well, to get involved, I must, I must jump on that one because there are, there are a couple of wonderful, um, fun things that we do. This year we had the seventh annual Lend to End Poverty event in Toronto. It happens in the second week of May and it's just Google it, Lend to End Poverty. It's our, our fundraising event in Toronto. Great fun after work party on for, for, for it's on Bay Street, but it's not, you don't have to be a Bay Streeter to do it. And, and another one we do is that we had the fifth annual Tip to Tip for Africa, three day fundraising bike ride on Prince Edward Island, the only place that you can ever on a weekend go from tip to tip of a province and raise money for, to help poverty in South Africa at the very same time. And apart from that, go to our website. We're always looking for volunteers. There are things you can do other than raise money, although certainly raising money, every dollar counts. We have spent very, very little money over the last 12 years, but now that we're beginning to really have an impact on policy changes in South Africa, we need, we need to raise a lot more annually. Now, your website then is uh, the, the townshipsproject.org? Yes. Got that right? That's right. The Townships Project. Got it. Org. Well, Martha, I really enjoyed having you here today, and thank you for sharing your inspiring story with my viewers. Thank you, Shannon, very much for this opportunity. And best of luck. We need it. Thank you. Well, for more information uh, about Extraordinary Women or to contact me, you can visit the website at ExtraordinaryWomenTV.com. Of course, you can follow me on Twitter at uh, Shannon underscore Skinner. I'm on Facebook as well. You can find my Facebook page, Extraordinary Women TV. would love to have you join me there. Special thanks to my family and friends for your ongoing support. And, of course, if you are interested in transforming your life, I hope these stories have inspired you. You've been watching Extraordinary Women TV with Shannon Skinner. We'll see you soon.